Okay. So, uh, by way of introduction, let me just quickly say why I think Sabah and Sarawak are very uh, special in the Federation of Malaysia and also why it's very, very different. I think we start off by understanding geography. I think Sabah and Sarawak, a lot of people do not realize this, uh, is actually not located on the mainland, but rather on the island of Borneo and fiscally is actually uh, larger than the whole of uh, the Malay Peninsula. But in terms of population, it's much, much smaller. It's only about 20% of Malaysia's population. And the unique thing is that unlike uh, Malaya, the majority of the people in Sabah and Sarawak are non-Malays. Now, Sabah is a Muslim majority state, but Sarawak is the only non-Muslim majority state in Malaysia. So there are some unusual uh, features about it. So traditionally, if you speak to Malaysians, uh, especially those from Malaya, uh, Sabah and Sarawak are widely seen as underdeveloped, uh, backward politically. Uh, the people there are seen as unsophisticated. There's too much corruption. And in some ways, it's also seen as a very exotic place. Uh, the other constant complaint you hear about Sabah, Sarawak, of course, is that you know, it's a very strange place because you need a passport to enter uh, these two states. So uh, one of the things about foreigners coming to Malaysia is that you know you enter through KLIA, you show your passport, but what you probably would not realize that if you go to Sabah or Sarawak, you need to show your passport a second time because those states control their own immigration. It also has a very, very different history, culture, languages compared to Malaya. And it's often been ignored, as I mentioned earlier, by scholars except probably in the discipline of anthropology. It's always been seen as a place where anthropologists go and, and study tribal societies. So for this morning, I just want to cover the reason why uh, Sabah and Sarah are unhappy, and I want to talk a bit about the quality of succession in both states. So I'll do this fairly quickly by covering basically uh, four key themes. The first is that what is the grievances about? Why are the people of Sabah and Sarawak so unhappy? They actually think of succession. From then on, I move on to the federal government response. How do they deal with this issue? And from there, I move on to the issue of state nationalists. What do the state nationalists want? And finally, I'll speak something about the secessionist movement in both Sabah and Sarawak. So what are the key grievances of the people of Sabah and Sarawak? I think when you talk to them, uh, basically you can sort of summarize up into five key areas. Uh, the first is that they're complaining that there was no real consent uh, given by the people of Sabah and Sarawak when the Federation of Malaysia was established in 1963. Secondly, they'll keep talking about a thing called the 20 points. Third, they'll talk about the status of Sabah and Sarawak in the Malaysian Federation since 1963. They'll also talk a lot about federal intervention in state politics of both states. And finally, I think they will also talk about the Malayan political model and how this is trying to be, uh, sorry, and how this is being imposed onto the Sarawak and Sabah political scene. So in terms of the Malaysia agreement, I think if you were to look at the Malaysia agreement, if you look at the process of how the Federation came about, you'll see that it is quite a long process. It took almost two years. And on paper, at least, it appears that there was a lot of consultation. For example, uh, after Tunku Abdul Rahman announced that he wanted to form a federation, uh, there was a thing called MSCC. Then there was a thing called the IGC. They even set up a commission called the Cobalt Commission to come to talk to the people of Sabah and Sarawak. And then a formal agreement was signed in London. Then a second mission came over and this was established by the UN before the federation was officially proclaimed on the 16th of September. So on paper, it looks that extensive consultation will carry out. But let me show you something else. Let me just give you a timeline, but with a different set of dates in red. So you can see that uh, although consultations did take place, a lot of time in the background, the British intervened to make sure that the federation came about. So for example, immediately after Tunku announced his proposal that he wanted to federate all the British uh, territories in Southeast Asia. Uh, there was a secret meeting on June the 4th when the most uh, senior British officials met in Singapore uh, 
and they were told in no uncertain terms that uh, they have to make sure that the civil service go all up to make sure that the people will support this proposal. Then on 17th of July, 1962, some like nine months later, Macmillan, the British Prime Minister, the Tungku, actually met in London. And even before uh, any form of consultation took place uh, among the local people, the leaders have already decided that uh, Sabah and Sarawak were to be part of this larger federation. And they actually decided the date of independence on the 17th of July, 62. So you can see that a year even before the whole process took place, the British had, and the Malayan government with Tunggal Drama had already decided that the federation will be formed. We also have papers uh, from the uh, British UN mission that when the British, sorry, when the UN sent the UN mission to Sabah and Sarawak to look at the process, the British actually intervened uh, to make sure that, that they will get a report that says that the people of Sabah and Sarawak do support the process of the formation of the Federation. So again, uh, there's a lot of paper uh, trial that shows quite clearly that the British were basically uh, keen on this Federation and there was nothing that uh, could be done to stop this Federation uh, from, be, uh, from coming into being. Right, let's talk about the 20 points. What is the 20 points? So basically, when the British set up a thing called the Tobot Commission, when they came to talk to the people of Sabah and Sarawak, uh, basically they asked for submissions from the people there about this idea of the Federation. So in terms of the submission, the summary is that the people wanted certain key items before that they would accept the Federation, if the Federation was to go ahead. So some of the key items was that Islam's status as a national religion was not applicable to Sabah and Sarawak. Immigration had to be under the control of the state government, even after federation. The civil service had to be bonionized. In other words, uh, local people had to be appointed into the civil service. Uh, this was done mainly because at that time, there were lots of expatriate, white expatriates in the civil service. And the people of Sabah and Sarawak were worried that once the expatriate leave the civil service, uh, Malayan civil servants will come over and take over senior positions. They also wanted to make sure that you cannot modify any of these safeguards, these 20 points, without the agreement of the Sabah and Sarawak state governments. Uh, there will be no right to succeed from the federations. And also the indigenous people of Sabah and Sarawak will enjoy the so-called special rights given to the Malay community in Malaya. And perhaps most importantly, Sabah and Sarawak will be given a high degree of autonomy, especially in terms of financial affairs. So on the right-hand side, you can see I put a tick and a cross on all these items. So for item number one, in terms of Islam, uh, Sarawak is the only state in Malaysia where Islam is not the state religion. But in Sabah in the 1970s, they actually changed the Sabah constitution to make Islam the state religion. Immigration is the only item where uh, hasn't changed. The states of Sabah and Sarawak still control their own immigration. And that's the reason why I said earlier that, you know, if you're a foreigner in Malaysia, if you want to go to Sabah and Sarawak, you need to show your passport at the airport. In terms of modernization, it never happened. Uh, in fact, uh, a lot of Malayan, senior Malayan, were sent over to Sabah and Sarawak to take over the civil service. Also, in terms of modification of the safeguards, so basically for the last 50 years, a lot of the safeguards granted under the 20 points uh, were actually transferred to Kuala Lumpur. In terms of the indigenous people of Sabah and Sarawak enjoying the so-called Bumaputra rights in, uh, in the Federation, uh, many of these uh, leaders who argue that the indigenous people of Sabah and Sarawak are actually what they call third class Bumaputras. They've never really uh, experienced any of the preferential benefits that was given to the Malay community. And of course, the idea of autonomy uh, never really took place. <clears throat> so what we're talking about is basically a list of broken promises in the 20 points. And also there's also a list of unbroken promises, which was that Sabah and Surat would develop uh, rapidly 
and that Sabah and Sirat, in terms of its development process, will be on par with the development in Malaya. And of course, that never happened. In fact, if you look at the pace of development in Sabah and Sarawak, one can make quite a powerful argument that Sabah and Sarawak has been deliberately underdeveloped. And the reason I said that is because if you speak to the people in Sabah and Sarawak, uh, they keep complaining that although Sabah and Sarawak are major oil and gas exporting states, a lot of the money for oil and gas were actually taken away and the money was used to develop Malaya rather than Sabah and Sarawak. And the examples they like to give is that, for example, the North-South Highway in Malaya was built in the 1980s. And 50 years after Federation, you still don't find a highway linking Sarawak to Sabah. In fact, they've just started to build the Ben Borneo Highway, and the highway will not be completed until at least 2025. It was also during this period, the first Mahathir period, when he was prime minister from 1981 to 2003, when a lot of the state powers was actually taken away from Sabah and Sarawak and centralized in the hands of the federal government. Now, in terms of the status of Sabah and Sarawak, uh, there's lots of unhappiness again. Uh, a lot of it is symbolic. Uh, so for example, when the Federation was formed in 1963, the actual wordings of the Federation was that the states of the Federation shall be A, a list of all the states in Malaya, Secondly, the Borneo states, Sabah and Sarawak, and see the state of Singapore. But this was changed in, 19, uh, in, in 1976, when the article was amended and Sabah and Sarawak was lumped together with all the other states in the Federation. So one of the unhappiness is that, you know, Sabah and Sarawak should not be lumped with all the other states because Sabah and Sarawak are the founders of the federation, they're not mere states. So this is the issue of whether Sabah and Sarawak is one of three or one of 13 states in Malaysia. Now, this is a big debate in Sabah and Sarawak, although in Malaya, this is a non-issue. Now, because this article is very, very controversial, in 2019, there was a constitution amendment to bring it back to the original wording, eh? to this wording. But that constitution amendment fell, it did not work. And I'll explain the reasons why in a little while. <clears throat> uh, the fourth area of unhappiness is, of course, the issue of federal intervention in state politics. And I've given here, I've given a list of uh, years when the federal government intervened in the state politics. So basically, the bottom line is that the federal government wanted two things from Sabah and Sarawak. They wanted to make sure that the chief ministers of both states were basically Muslims. Secondly, they wanted to make sure that the leaders of Sabah and Sarawak, whoever get into the top office, were pro-federal leaders. Every time you get a leader from Sabah and Sarawak who challenged the authority of the federal government or challenged the authority of UMNO, the federal government will intervene and try to replace that person. One area where the people of Sabah are really unhappy about Malaysia, and this is a feature that's unique to Sabah, not Sarawak, is a thing called Project M. The M here stands for Project Mahate. So basically what happened was that when the Kadazan Dusun uh, uh, majority in Sabah tried to challenge uh, Kuala Lumpur, there was an attempt made to Islamize Sabah. So the way they did it was very clever. Basically, they increased the population of the Muslims in Sabah. So if you look at statistics from 1970 to 2010, there was a 390% increase in Sabah's population. Uh, that uh, was done deliberately. Eh? It's, it's not a natural increase. So the idea was that if you increase the Muslim population in Sabah, you also make Muslim majority seats the biggest group among all the seats in the Sabah legislature. So you can see in 1976, the majority of seats in the Sabah assembly 
were made up of non-Muslim Sikhs, KDM Sikhs, huh? Kadazan Dusun Muru Sikhs. So there were 22 Kadazan Dusun Muru Sikhs compared to 13 Muslim Sikhs. This situation was reversed in 1976 when you ended up with 30 Muslim Sikhs. So it was very clear that from 1976 onwards, the only outcome in terms of all state elections in Sabah was that you either get a Muslim government or a Muslim plus government. In other words, the Kadazan Dusung indigenous people no longer had a chance to form a government in Sabah. And finally, the export of Malayan political model to Sabah and Sarawak. As all of you know, the key ingredient in politics of Malaya is race and religion. Now, race and religion, although it's a big issue in Sabah and Sarawak, it is not as sharp as what you find in Peninsula Malaysia. Uh, in fact, you'll find that uh, in many families in Sabah and Sarawak, uh, you got people with multiple religions within the same family. Uh, you got people who are Christians from different denominations. You also have Muslims in the same family and they tend to live side by side without much problems. Uh, one of the features you find in Sabah and Sarawak is that very often in small uh, villages or small towns, you find that the Surau the, or the mosque is located very, very close to a church. And they never had any problems. Huh? Unlike the religious tension that you find in Malaya. So basically, the argument is that Malaya is trying to export its very toxic politics of race and religion into the relatively harmonious society of Sabah and Sarawak. So that's the reason why issues like Allah has created a huge controversy in Sabah and Sarawak. Because the Muslims in both states do not object to Christians or other groups in Sabah and Sarawak using the word Allah unlike the Malays in Peninsula Malaysia, who object non-Muslims using the word Allah. The, the other example that's often been given is that if you go to Kopitiam, say Sabah and Sarawak, you'll find that halal and non-halal food are sold next to each other. Uh, you will never be able to find something like this in Peninsula Malaysia. So I'll move on to the second part of my presentation, which is this unhappiness in Sabah and Sarau. So what is the reaction of the federal government? So we'll start off by looking at the Najib or the Barasan National Administration. Uh, Najib was in power from 2009 to 2018. So he started taking notice of Sabah and Sarawak after 2008. And the reason is because in 2008, after the general election, the Barisan National lost its two-thirds majority. And in fact, Without the MPs from Sabah and Sarawak, the Barisan National Government would have fallen. Now, Najib understood suddenly that Sabah and Sarawak became crucial to the survival of the Barisan National. So that's the reason why he suddenly appointed after the 2008 general elections, more than 20 Sabahans and Sarawakians into the cabinet, either as ministers or deputy ministers. He created a new public holiday called Malaysia Day September 16, and this was a nod to the Federation of Malaysia, which was created on the 16th of September. Prior to that, Malaysians celebrate Hari Merdeka on the 31st of August, which is the date of independence from Malaya, not Malaysia. He also appointed Sabahans and Sarawakians as the Speaker of the Malaysian Parliament and the deputies, again for the very first time. And he also set up a federal cabinet MA63 committee to discuss the unhappiness and see what could be done to address this unhappiness. Unfortunately for Najib, uh, this committee never completed its work because Barisan National fell from power in 2018. So during the two short years of Pakatan Harapan government under Mahate, Sabah and Sarawak actually had a very, very high profile. It was uh, one of the top items the Pakatan Harapan uh, political agenda. So if you look at the Pakatan Harapan manifesto during the 2018 election, one of the five key pillars of the manifesto actually dealt with Sabah and Sarawak. 
So this was the first time since independence in 57 that Sabah and Sarawak were left, right and center in terms of political agenda at the federal level. So one of the things that Mahathir did was that he set up a federal uh, MA63 committee, uh, committee similar to what Najib did. And this time he placed it under the law minister Kobi Kelly from Sabah. Uh, that committee dealt with 21 issues. These 21 issues were basically administrative issues. Uh, this was issue brought up uh, by the federal government, brought up by the state's government of Sabah and Sarawak. At the end of the two years, uh, basically they managed to resolve 17 out of 21 issues. Uh, the focus of that committee was on decentralization and returning state powers uh, that were centralized during the Mahate, the first Mahate administration. The four big issues they were never able to resolve were basically the issue of who owns the right to the oil and gas and the continental shelf uh, of the coast of Sabah and Sarawak. Uh, this was uh, basically an argument of uh, money because whoever control oil and gas obviously have access to billions and billions of dollars. Uh, although the committee produced a draft report, that draft report was never submitted to the government formally uh, because, uh, as you know, in 2020, uh, February 2020, the Pakatan Harapan government imploded and you had a new government. Uh, the draft report currently is placed under the Official Secrets Act and very few people have access to it. Now, early on, I mentioned about a failed constitution amendment in 2019. So one of the promises made in one of the five pillars in the Pakata Harapan Manifesto was that they will bring the original wording in 1963 back to the constitution. Uh, basically, they tried doing that, but Sarawak was not happy with the constitution amendment. So Sarawak gang up with AMNO and passed and they didn't have enough numbers to pass the constitution amendment. In Malaysia, in order to pass the constitution amendment, basically you need the support of two thirds of all the MPs in parliament. So they were uh, you know, not possible. They were not able to get the two thirds majority. So the constitution amendment did not pass. So the bottom line is for me at least, Mahathe was really not in favor of more Sabah and Sarawak rights. Although he paid lip service to this idea of Sabah and Sarawak rights, he was really uh, not in favor of it. You have to remember during his first turn as prime minister in the 1980s, 1990s, the big thing about Mahathe was all about centralization of powers. And I'll argue that when he came back into power as the prime minister second time, he hasn't changed his mind about centralization of powers. Uh, he didn't like the idea of giving more powers to Sabah and Sarawak because he thought that basically giving power to Sabah and Sarawak means more trouble for the federal government. You have to remember uh, when he was prime minister in the 1980s, he faced a lot of challenge from the Kadazan Dusuns in Sabah, as I mentioned earlier, and he was forced to, uh, you know, to put out this plan called Project M to increase the Muslim population in Sabah. So he really didn't like this idea of giving more rights or decentralizing more powers to Sabah and Sarawak although he never said any of this in public. Uh, it was also during his period that, you know, it was also very difficult to get an agreement in terms of more rights for Sabah and Sarawak because Sarawak was not part of Pakatan Harapan. Sarawak was a sort of an independent player. Although in Sabah, the ruling party, Warisan, although they were not part of uh, Pakatan Harapan formally, they were at least Pakatan Harapan friendly. So moving on quickly to the Muyading Yasin era, which is the era that we're living under now, which is from 2020 onwards, the Perikatan National Government. Now, the context of this government is very, very different from the Mahathir government. Uh, on this government, it is the reverse of what happened to Najib. Uh, this time, uh, GPS, which is the ruling party in Sarawak, which consists of the old Sarawak Barisa National, they are the one who got in very early to support Muyadin to help him become the prime minister and to set up the PN administration. And therefore, he relies on GPS to stay in power. GPS currently has 18 MPs, and that is a huge block in the Perikatan National Administration, given the fact that they only have one seat majority. 
So this means that GPS certainly has become very, very powerful at the federal level. Now, one of the things that GPS has been asking for, and Muyeding agree, is that they want more powers back to Sarawak. And one of the things they ask for is for the federal government to force Petronas to accept the sales tax on oil and gas from Sarawak and force Petronas to pay the sales tax, which amounts to about $3 billion. Uh, previously, Petronas uh, never agreed to this because Petronas' argument is that under the Petroleum Development Act of 1974, they own the rights to all, all the gas resources in Malaysia, and they don't have to worry about whatever or all these sales tax at the, at the state level. But because uh, GPS has such a stranglehold over the Muyading administration, uh, Muyading basically asked Petronas to pay up and told Petronas uh, to stop mounting a court challenge against the Surat government. The other thing that Muyadin did was that he named a special minister for Sabah and Surat affairs. This has not happened since the 1970s, huh? that you had a minister named after Sabah and Surat affairs. And this minister is located in the Prime Minister's department, uh, Max Onkili from Sabah, and the deputy is actually from Sarawak, the daughter of the Sarawak governor. So the first thing they did was similar to all the two previous administration, they set up a new MA63 committee. And again, the focus is on decentralization and some legal change to some of the wordings in the constitution. Uh, they're agreeable. There's an agreement that they will try to do the constitution amend, amendment again, but only when Perikatan is stable. Right now, the Perikatan government is very unstable. So they're not going to bring in the constitutional amendment until all the political infighting has stopped. And that will probably not happen uh, very soon. Now, because of all this instability and the inability of the current government to bring constitutional amendment, uh, Muya then decided to take the middle path or the easy path. And he has issued an administrative order that the federal machinery will now refer to Sabah as Surah's Wilaya territory rather than mere states. Again, this is just a cosmetic change. The idea is that he does all these small things to keep the people of Sabah and Sarawak happy. So the focus of the Muyering administration is really about winning Sabah, which they did in 2020, because Sabah is considered opposition state. But since the state election of September 2020, Sabah is now part of the Perikatan government. And of course, uh, he's also uh, putting in a lot of resources for the upcoming Sarawak elections. Again, with this MS63 committee, the big issue is the oil and gas. Again, the federal government is unwilling to give up the ownership of the oil and gas issue. So I suspect this MS63 committee uh, will not be able to resolve this issue. So my take is that Muyeding is also like Mahathir not in favor of giving more rights to Sabah and Sarawak other than cosmetic changes. As I said earlier, things like changing the name from states to Wilaya. And basically, he doesn't have a lot of time to deal with Sabah and Sarawak issues because he's fighting for the survival of the Basatu Perikatan uh, National Government. So I want to quickly move on to the last part, which is the state nationalists. So one of the unusual things if you go to Sabah and Sarawak today is that you'll find that all the major political parties and major polit politicians in both states said that they support MA63 and they're all state nationalists. Uh, in some ways, the campaign for state nationalism is more active in Sarawak compared to Sabah. And part of the reasons is because in Sarawak, some of these groups are openly supported by powerful politicians in the state government. So they have some sort of support from the state government in order to pursue this policy. So you'll find that in Sabah and Sarawak, you find taglines like Sabah for Sabahans, Sarawak for Sarawakians. Uh, they even have taglines like Malayans out, Sarasit, or, you know, this is a play on the Brexit name. So basically the idea is that, you know, they want Malaya out of Sabah and Sarawak and they want to be left alone for full autonomy. The mobilization is done mostly through social media. Uh, these groups are very active on Facebook and WhatsApp groups. And also in the major towns, they hold gatherings and talks. So if you were to look at it collectively, you can sort of divide up these three groups, uh, sorry, 
divide up this stat nationalist into three broad groups. Uh, the first group is what I might call the return to MA63 group. Uh, this is the group that campaigns for full autonomy, uh, the campaign for a full back to the 20 points, or full implementation of 20 points, and the idea is to kick uh, Malaya out of Sabah and Sarawak as much as possible. Uh, this also means taking back control areas like health, education, oil and gas. Uh, the second group is basically what we might call the move forward group. Uh, this is the group argues that the Federation of Malaysia uh, is valid. All we need to do is to look forward and not to the past and renegotiate with the federal government. So the idea is to make sure that Sabah and Sarawak are not treated as states in the Federation, but treated as founders of the Malaysian Federation and therefore has special status in the Federation. The third group is the focus of today's seminar. And this is the group that argues that it is too late, that the whole Federation has been a complete failure. And therefore the only way out is to pull Sabah and Sarawak out of the Federation and seek independence. Right, so what are some of the arguments used by the secessionists? Uh, if you talk to them, basically you can sort of summarize up all the key items into sort of eight major points. Uh, the first one, of course, is that uh, they keep arguing that the Malaysia agreement is broken. Uh, it is broken because the federal government broke too many of the promises. Uh, and here they keep referring to the 20 points. Uh, so the idea is that they said that the treaty is broken, it is an international treaty, and therefore they threaten to take it to international court and domestic court to sue the federal government. Secondly, they talk about how the federal government of Lay has learned all the resources, and therefore, uh, you know, the fact that they never developed Sabah and Sarab means that, you know, the whole idea of this federation where everyone will be treated equally. Uh, since it didn't happen, again, another reason to break away. Uh, the third point they always made is that this Malayan framework, something that I mentioned earlier, will never work in Sabah and Sarawak, uh, simply because uh, the demographic is completely different, the culture is completely different, the history is completely different. The fourth point they made is that uh, Sabah and Sarawakians are never wanted to be in Malaysia in the first place. Uh, they were conned into Malaysia basically by uh, the political elites and by the British. And they like to give the examples of uh, getting out of Malaysia. They like to give the example of Singapore. They said that when Singapore got out of Malaysia in 65, Singapore had nothing, but today Singapore is a very, very successful uh, country. So Singapore has done very well outside the Federation and therefore we can as well. Uh, they like to give the example that you know Singapore had no resources while well, Sabah and Sarawak have plenty of oil and gas. So therefore we are in a much stronger position if we were to break away from the Federation of Malaysia. Uh, the other favorite example I'd like to use is that the Sing dollar is now worth uh, three times the Malaysian ringgit. Uh, so basically the idea is that, you know, if we do a Singapore, we will be successful like Singapore as well. Uh, they also like to point to a thing called the Chagos uh, affair. Chagos is actually a small island in the Indian Ocean. So uh, a few years ago, there was an International Court of Justice advisory opinion saying that uh, Chagos should be granted independence uh, because the British had no right to take away the sovereignty of the Chagos uh, people. Uh, so a lot of the secessionists argue that you have the same situation in Sabah and Sarawak. The British had no right to give the sovereignty of Sabah and Sarawak to Malaya to form the new Federation of Malaysia. And this leads me to the next point, which is that they argue that Sabah and Sarawak were actually independent entity before the formation of Malaysia. They also argue that succession is really not an issue in terms of the Malaysian law, because the word succession is not mentioned in the federal constitution. And of course, they made the common sense argument that if you can join something, it also, although it's not written down, it also gives you the right to live, and therefore. If you join the federation and things don't work out, you know, then you have the automatic right to leave the federation as well. Now, many of these movements, and there are quite a number of them, are actually led by very colorful personalities, usually a very strong personality in Sabah and Sarawak. One of the interesting things is that although they all agree that the Malaysia Federation has been a failure and that 
Zaba and Siraj should seek independence. They actually don't work with each other. Uh, there are certain cases where they actually try to undermine each other as well. There's also a lot of misinformation in this space. Uh, the example I give is that there is a Sabahang uh, who is actually not a lawyer at all, who's not a trained lawyer, but he makes, uh, you know, he goes around, uh, you know, giving a lot of seminars, uh, Facebook sessions, what have you, where he talks about the legal aspects of the Malaysia Agreement and how uh, you can actually uh, you know, sue the federal government, how the federal government can actually be taken to court uh, using legal arguments, although he himself is not a, a lawyer. And one of the strange things that a lot of people in Sabah and Sarawak actually buy into this argument, although if you speak to a uh, constitutional lawyer, they'll tell you that a lot of the stuff he says are actually rubbish. And also one of the important things that you need to know is that the MA63 agreement itself has never been tested in the Malaysian court. So when people give legal opinions about MA63, right, basically they're speculating because none of this has actually been litigated in the Malaysian court. And so there is no uh, court history or precedence in terms of items related to Malaysia agreement. Uh, these groups also use a lot of coded language. Uh, sometimes they don't come out openly to say that they want Sabah and Sarawak to break away from the federation. So they talk about things like, let's hold a federation, let's hold a referendum. So they push for referendum on the status of Sabah and Sarawak in the federation. So basically the idea of holding a referendum is that if they can get the majority of people in Sabah and Sarawak to agree that Sabah and Sarawak have no place in the federation anymore. It's sort of an indirect way of saying that we need to break away. Uh, the other favorite word in the use is, of course, self-determination. The only political party in, in Sarawak, or in fact, in Sabah and Sarawak, openly calls for independence is a new political party called Parti Bumi Kinyalan. Uh, it's quite an interesting party. It's basically uh, been on the ground active for the last two years. And, and, and they, they only have one platform which is to make Sarawak independent. <clears throat> now, one of the interesting things about the secessionist movement is the international dimension. And this is often forgotten by people uh, you know, who look into this issue. A lot of these groups actually uh, have supporters overseas. And I'll just list uh, the four main ones here, which is very active uh, uh, overseas. The first one is a thing called SSKM, Sabah Sarawak Kelawa, Malaysia. It is run by a Sabahan lady called Doris Jones. She's actually ethnic Chinese. Uh, and it is set up in the UK and they've been actively promoting this idea of uh, SSKM, Sabah and Sarak Kelawa, Malaysia. Uh, they were very high profile a couple of years ago, but in the last few years, they've sort of lost momentum. Uh, the second group is a group that was set up in Melbourne, Australia. It's called Sabah Sarak Rights, Australia, New Zealand. It was essentially set up by a former Sarawakian who is a lawyer living in, a retired lawyer living in Melbourne. Uh, basically, this group also, pro, also actively promotes uh, independence for Sabah Sarawak. Unaffiliated group to SSR ANZ is a group called Sabah Sarawak Borneo Natives Organization, again, based mostly in, in Melbourne. And this is a group trying to uh, promote the idea of uh, uh, native nationalism or Borneo Native nationalism uh, in Sabah. Uh, although it's called uh, Borneo Natives, most of the membership and most of the supporters are actually uh, from Sabah. Uh, the final group I will just mention very briefly here is a group called Borneo Dayak Forum International. Uh, this is a group based in KK. Uh, it is linked to uh, Jeffrey Kittingan's uh, party, uh, Star in Sabah. And basically, they want to promote this idea of pan Borneo diet unity, and also indirectly rejecting the idea of the Malaysian Federation. So the last question is that, is it possible to succeed from Malaysia currently? Um, I'll argue the following. The first one is that it is quite obvious that the Malay establishment, the Malay elites in Peninsula Malaysia or the federal government uh, will not allow succession under any circumstances. Uh, the Malay establishment uh, are still wounded by what happened to Singapore in 1965. And they've come to the conclusion that they will never allow something like this or something similar uh, 
uh, like this to happen ever again in the Federation. So in other words, they were never allowed Sabah and Sarawak to live peacefully like in the case of Singapore. Uh, it is my contention that they will use violence and the Malaysian case is called enforced disappearance if necessary uh, for the people involved in these movements. But it is more likely they will use things like the Sedition Act and SOSMA to arrest and detain those people involved in the secessionist movement. I personally met a few of these people who were forced to uh, apply for political asylum in Australia uh, because they were harassed by the Malaysian Special Branch because they were uh, promoting this idea of uh, secession from uh, the Federation of Malaysia. One of the reasons why the Malay elites uh, will not grant Sabah and Sarawak full autonomy is because they worry that if we give Sabah and Sarawak more rights, uh, other states in Malaya will also ask for similar rights. And here I'm talking about two states in Malaya where we know there's very strong state identity and strong state nationalism. I'm referring to Johor and Kelantan. It is almost certain if Sabah and Sarawak get full autonomy, Johor and Kelantan will ask for similar political a similar political deal. And if they give into uh, Johor and Kelantan, then the other states will probably come knocking on the door of the federal government as well. And the argument, of course, is that you can't have a federal system where uh, there's too much autonomy given to the states. Otherwise, it will not be a federal system. And uh, this is the view of the federal government. So one of the things the federal government is trying to deal in terms of dealing with this secessionist movement is that uh, they're trying to increase Islamization in both states. Uh, they have been partially successful in Sabah, as I mentioned earlier. After Project M, uh, they've made Sabah a Muslim majority state. Uh, previously, it was a Kadazan uh, Dusun majority state in Sabah, a non-Muslim majority. Now it's a Muslim majority state in Sabah. They're also encouraging a lot of young Sabahans and Sarawakians to move to Malaya. So the idea is to expose them to Malaya uh, create deep ties to marriage, education work in order to dilute the state identity of both states. So, for example, it is a well-known fact that a lot of Sabahans and Sarawakians, uh, especially the native population, are given uh, uh, scholarships to study in Malaya under this MARA scheme where they stay in, in boarding schools in Peninsula, Malaysia. The idea is to, is to get them used to the Malayan system. Uh, very often, uh, the underlying thing is to convert them to become Muslims. So because in, in the Malayan context, uh, not Sabah and Sarawak, but in the Malayan context, if you become a Muslim, you become a Malay or Masa Malayu. Now, in terms of the key to succession, I'll argue that uh, what is, if they really want to pursue this successionist thing, uh, the key to it is probably several things. The first is that they really need a charismatic leader who can unite all the successionist groups in Sabah and Sarawak. Currently, that's lacking. Uh, they must be able to maintain a strong state identity for a very long period. Uh, they must be able to get majority support among the people in Sabah and Sarawak. Most importantly, they need to attract the next generation of younger Sabahans and Sarawakians. Uh, right now, they're trying to do that through social media. It's very difficult to judge how successful they are. Uh, but if they're successful in creating a whole generation of Sabahans and Sarawakians, who believe that Sabahans and Sarawakians got a raw deal in Malaysia, uh, this will promote the idea of secessionists in the long run. And of course, they need some form of international recognition of their struggle. And finally, I think they need uh, really key individuals who believe in this secessionist narrative and get them elected into the state assembly of both states. So in summary, I know I've spoken too long, but in summary, I think the issue is real and it will not go away for the foreseeable future. I think it's a compelling narrative about marginalization and self-determination, not only in Malaysia, but throughout many areas of Southeast Asia. Uh, the things that comes to mind immediately is Southern uh, Thailand, uh, Southern Philippines, uh, West Papua, and it's very much a legacy of colonial rule that the fact that the British actually, uh, rather than really asking what the people wanted when the British decided to leave Southeast Asia, they forced all these territories to come together. 
So this is a legacy of British rule. But the bottom line is that the federal government really have to act on this issue. The federal government have to decide what it wants to do with this issue. Because uh, my argument is this secessionist movement will always be present from now on. It's a question of whether it's a big movement or a small movement. And finally, I think scholars who are interested in Malaysia should really pay more attention to what is happening in Sabah and Sarawak. So before I finish, let me just quickly show you some pictures. I think it's always good to show you some pictures of what's happening. So you can see in Sarawak, right? Uh, these are people holding public demonstration in support of independence, okay? So they even produce a poster that says 7-22, July 22nd is Sarawak Independence Day. So they do it openly, yeah? Uh, this will never happen in any towns or cities or public space in uh, Peninsular Malaysia. You will immediately get arrested. But as I mentioned, in places like Sarawak, they have unofficial support from the state government, and therefore these things are allowed to proceed. So this is an interesting thing. So you can see they hold a ceremony to celebrate Sarawak's independence. So for this group, the independence of Sarawak is the day when the last governor of Sarawak, the last colonial governor of Sarawak left in July 22nd. When he left, Sarawak became independent. And September that year, he joined the Federation of Malaysia. So for a short period, they argued that Sarawak was actually an independent entity. So if you look at this, right, what is interesting about all these public ceremonies, huh? the guy in white in the middle is actually the current state governor, uh, governor of Sarawak. So you can see that all the top political leaders are actually take part in this ceremony. Now, what is really interesting about this picture, right? Even though it's an official ceremony, you will see that there is no Malaysian flag. There is no flag of Malaysia in any of these pictures. Huh? All the flags you see are actually Sarawak flag. Right? So these are some of the uh, people I mentioned about. The people talk about uh, the secessionists. Uh, and one of the things they do is that, you know, they use uh, pretty models to sell uh, t-shirts to sort of promote the idea of, of uh, succession or promote the idea of independence of Sabah Sarawak. Okay. I spoke about uh, party booming King Yalang, and you can see that these are some of the people who openly advocate for uh, independence. Uh, on, on social media, they promote this idea of uh, you know, separate identity cards for Sabah and Sarawak. And the bottom picture, uh, picture of this group called Sabah Sarawak Rights Australia New Zealand, which is also promoting the idea of independence for Sabah Sarawak. Okay, these are some uh, cartoons that they use in social media. And on the bottom is a picture of, of, uh, you know, of a demonstration outside the, the State Library in Victoria, Melbourne. And they're protesting about uh, uh, Petronas stealing all the oil and gas from Sabah and Sarawak. Okay, uh, this one's interesting. There's a petition calling for Sabah Sarawak to separate from Malaysia. But more interestingly enough that these groups has been going around collecting signature and they wrote to the queen, asking the queen to intervene, uh, you know, to intervene because they argue that the UK was, was part of the agreement uh, to form the Federation of Malaysia. So since the Federation of Malaysia is a failed experiment, uh, the UK should come back and you know, and and do something about uh, Sabah and Sarawak. So they wrote a letter to the Queen, and this is the reply they received from the Foreign Office. Okay, so I'll finish here very quickly, and and just to tell you that I wrote two uh, fairly short articles. If you're more interested in this, you can read more about this uh, these two articles. Thank you very much. <laughs>